we have this time together tonight to worship. I'm sure my mic is on there. Glad to have visitors in our midst. It means a lot that you come to, to be here. Some of you at the invitation of a friend, others just dropping in. That means, uh, means the world to us. We'd love to show uh, our true concern for you. If you got here too late for us to, to maybe be greet with you, we'd love to talk with you after service. Give everyone a return invitation to be back with us this Wednesday, our next corporate time together. Uh, had a good start to our men's class Wednesday. Uh, men are continued to uh, be encouraged if you'd like to, to do that. I'm glad we have choices and uh, good teachers and all those classes. But uh, that was a, a good first start. I appreciate uh, those taking part in that. We've been praying about, I want to keep promoting and announcing about Jack Wilkie being with us in two weeks. Uh, we've had some excellent uh, speakers the last few years for these kind of April uh, shots in the arm, kind of year two and catering to our families. We'll need that. Uh, you can see those topics that Jack will be addressing. Uh, be a great opportunity to invite others to, to be here. Many will be interested in, in the things he has to discuss uh, from a, a godly perspective. I'm anxious myself about that. The lesson this evening about uh, Keep Yourself Pure is, is one of our series on timely topics for teens. I want to assure you I'm not picking on these young folks at all. Uh, we are addressing some lessons geared to them in some ways, but this is, like all of them, one we kind of step back and say, now wait, this isn't just for you and the specific focus that maybe some of you are assuming is much larger, much broader than uh, specifically, you know, this is the obligatory sex sermon. You have to trot out every so year, uh, so many years to the teenagers. It'll be some things from God's word that we say, but, but certainly from a, the whole framework and standpoint of a, a larger principle, and that is purity. And so I hope tonight you'll, you'll know this is not one guy talking to, preaching to, uh, however many we post that are here, this is all of us being reminded from God's Word. And there are lessons that are certainly beyond our teenagers' applications that we all make. But I'm thankful they're here and can be a part of this assembly. That uh, text I'm going to come back to actually at the very end of the lesson, kind of uh, not customary. Usually you talk about the, the opening text uh, from the outset, but let's save it for last. And let's talk about the concept of purity a word that occurs about 158 times in about, I think there are 10 different specific words in our English that we translate pure or purity, purify, things like that. A lot of those are in the Old Testament. In fact, if you look at the old versus the new, there's not a, an exact correlation here, but typically the Old Testament, using forms of the word, will focus on things. It'll focus on sacrifices or even uh, maybe the clothing of the priest and different things. It is an emphasis on externals primarily, not exclusively. But when you come to the New Testament, and if you were to take a concordance and see how it uses forms of the word pure, you find that by and large it is people. Some references to things, but more about us, specifically Christians, or at least principles of, well, pure speech and different things, hearts, faith, and and even consciences. And so that word will be used to modify principles and people more in the New Testament. That'll be more of our focus, although we'll be looking at some passages at both of them. We got three major points tonight. For those of you that love the three part outlines, this is your lesson. Number one, here it is. We're letting the, the Word of God kind of dictate the outline. God is pure. Understanding what that means is crucial to us. We'll look at some passages and the fact that. That God, being pure, is the only one who can purify us. He's the one that has the right to even define and have in our minds what it is to be pure and holy. And then building upon that, if God has purified me, I have to, number three, live up to the calling of God, the challenge to be as pure in all the areas, the different spheres that he's outlined for me. And so that's where we're going. The next one will have some verses for you. Here that will illustrate those three points. That's a lot of stuff for those of you taking notes. You're having a field day right now. Can't wait to hear how each one of these ties in to the concept of purity. How do we keep ourselves pure? Before we actually delve into God being pure, can I talk about the concept of most of us and to maybe get a common understanding that we like things to be pure? Does it really matter what your food is like? either that you purchase maybe from a grocery store or maybe that you slaughter if you kill animals, uh, uh, you know, and, and eat them. Does it matter? Did you 
pick up on the recall this past week of a certain food item? Sure. Does it matter what kind of water that you drink? You know, there are a lot of uh, people in foreign countries that we often take for granted that we have an abundance of, of clean and usable drinking water. A lot of people don't have that. And so I appreciate folks who are wanting to go to those countries and show them how to dig and maybe even drill uh, water so that they can have pure water. Some of them have diseases because they either don't understand or don't have the, the availability of clean water. Sure, we like clean water, don't we? Air? It's a matter that you're breathing polluted air or unpolluted air. For most of us, maybe we have some hang-ups or we get a little bit of OCD about some of these things, but sure, we like things to be pure. The food that we eat, water that we drink, the air that we breathe. Sometimes we're concerned about additives or chemicals, maybe in things that we touch that may have a harmful or detrimental effect. And so, yes, we know what it is, and we even esteem the, the concept of what is pure. Most of us, given the choice, will avoid things that are contaminated if we know they are. And so putting that from a, an arena that we can appreciate and, and comparing it, contrasting it to a spiritual arena, I want us to esteem and value as much moral purity, godly and spiritual purity as we ever would, things that really are, are not that uh, important comparatively, the, the food and the water, air, and, and all those things like that. Let's talk about God and his perfection. God who is in purity, absolutely possessed of a quality none of us could ever attain to. In 2 Samuel 22, verse 27, with the pure, you, God, will show yourself pure. And with the devious, you will show yourself shrewd. That's a verse, if you look at it, you might uh, misunderstand or you might think, well, if God is showing himself pure to pure people, does that mean he's showing himself impure to impure people? No. Pure people understand the, the preciousness, the, the great quality of, of what God is. Folks that aren't pure can't relate to that. They, they won't get it, I think, is essentially the, the message there. But, but underscore this, God is perfectly pure. Ways that none of us can be, but ways that we need to appreciate. Eliphaz said this in Job 4, verse 17, Can a mortal, that's us, can a person be more righteous than God? Can a man be more pure than his maker? That is a rhetorical question. Eliphaz, in asking the question, applied to Job nonetheless, is saying, no, we, none of us, can be greater than God to be more morally perfect or pure than God. That is his domain. That is uniquely God's. And in that same book, another uh, another of the friends of Job. In fact, Bildad will say this. How then can a man be righteous before God? How can he be pure who is born of a woman? If even the moon does not shine and the stars are not pure in his sight, how much less man who is a maggot and the son of man who is a worm? When Bildad is asking that question, how can man be pure? He's not conceiving of the fact that God could purify a person, but, but compared to God in his absolute holiness, we all are imperfect. We don't maintain a quality, uh, an integrity of purity like God does. In Psalm 12, verse 6, the words of the Lord are pure words, like silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. If God is pure, whatever he says, whatever he has said, Absolutely bears that character of, of perfect purity. Psalm uh, 19, verse, uh, I'm sorry, Psalm 19, verse 8. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. You know, folks, if you have people that make fun of the Word of God, that mock you because you believe in the Bible and go by it, may you be reminded there's not a, a better document there's not a, a product of man that can ever rival the Bible. And so uh, understand that in its absolute purity, you're in the right path. You have nothing to, to be ashamed of in following the words of God. And then Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 13. 
Speaking of God, Habakkuk says, You are of purer eyes than to behold evil and cannot look on wickedness. But Habakkuk goes on and says, Why do you look on those who deal treacherously? Hold your tongue when the wicked devours a person more righteous than he. Habakkuk had a lot of questions like we have, but he made an interesting observation about God. God, in his purity, cannot behold evil. I know he sees evil. He sees the wrong things that I do and you do. But it's the idea that God cannot approve of those. He cannot go along with those in his holiness. That's something that might make me want to run away from God. God says, don't let that. You need to run to me for the, the cleansing that I alone can give you. Let's let that be a segue into the next uh, passages we look at. If God is pure, and indeed he is, God is the one who purifies. The world often says, you know what? Uh, you pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. You, know, you make a way for yourself. We have this rugged individualism. It kind of bleeds into our thinking sometimes. I have to fix it. It's about me to, to make my own path. And I need to re rely on my smarts and my savvy to make it through this world. God says you can't do it. You don't have enough. And so in, in my desire to be pure, I turn to God. God, what can you do for me? Let me entertain it this way, looking in Proverbs 20, verse 6, and then in verse 9. A question is asked in verse 6. Most men will proclaim each his own goodness, but who can find a faithful man? You look at a lot of people in the world today, and they will tell you. If you ask them, sometimes even if you don't, I'm a good person. I'm fine. I'm okay. I don't need your gospel. I have no interest in your church. I am a good person. And you look at them and say, I'm glad that you're good. Maybe relatively speaking you are, but I'm a Christian because I'm not good. I came to Jesus in obedience because I am a sinner. And so he wants me to live good. I'm striving to do that, but, but kind of uh, on my own merits, I'm not. I am a sinner in need of God's grace there. And so who can find a faithful man? The seeming answer is there aren't a lot. In verse 9, who can say, I have made my heart clean. I am pure from my sin. Who can say that? I can't say that. If you're being honest with yourself, you can't say that. In fact, you're thinking, maybe some of you, we've got young folks here that are sinless. But you know what? They're not even pure because they've been released from sin. They're okay the way they are. If you live long enough, you're going to transgress. The point of this is none of us ought to feel so haughty or so God-independent that we could feel like, I'm okay. Don't need the blood of Jesus. God is the one that we turn to to purify us. There is a generation, Proverbs 30, 12 says, that is pure in its own eyes, yet is not washed from its filthiness. That kind of helps illustrate to me, it's not what society thinks about themselves or any person. That's not the standard. It is what God knows about them. So a lot of people feel okay. 3,000 years ago, it was the case as today. They're not okay just because they feel okay. They must come for the, the true purification through God and, and His Son. Listen to what is said about Jesus in, in Titus chapter 2, verse 14. I love this. Jesus gave Himself for us that He might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for Himself His own special people, zealous for good works gave himself for us. Why? To redeem us. Redeem us from what? Our lawless deeds. And not just to redeem us, but also to purify us. As I understand that, that is kind of the, the one point in time I come in obedience, but it's the ongoing response I have to him, the, the ever-present need for me to continue to be purified in his sight. God wants us to be, and I like this translation, his own special people. Everybody's special. Everybody's unique in God's sight. But in his church, among disciples or believers, there is a sense in which we are called out. We are different. We're like that Old Testament Israel, unique. And so purity demands that I act and appreciate uh, what God is able to do for me. And then in 1 Peter 1, 22, since you have purified your souls, notice 
purified your bodies? No, your souls. The biggest and the best part of me, in fact, the eternal enduring part of all of us is our soul. When I'm a Christian, Peter's writing to Christians, purified your souls. How? In obeying the truth. In obeying the truth through the Spirit, capital S, Holy Spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, you love one another fervently with a pure heart. You're going to see that verse, in fact, later on the outline. When it modifies or defines our heart, I, I need to know that God seeks that. He wants that. God is absolutely demanding of us pure hearts, and He can show us the, the way that that's accomplished. All right, I'm throwing a lot of stuff out at you, right? God is pure. God can purify me. In fact, he wants to purify all of us. He wants to purify us spiritually. That's the most important part. You know, I've used this for perhaps illustration before. If we could see people the way that God views people, moral defilement versus moral purity, how differently we would look, okay? You got the arguably best dressed person uh, the one who maybe showers repeated times a day and has the most elaborate cleansers and soap and shampoo and whatever, the best that money can buy, and yet they're not a Christian. God would look at them, if we were to see them externally, they'd be filthy, absolutely dirty from head to toe in ragged garments and all of that. God says, I know they look nice outside, but I'm, I'm looking inwardly. If we could look at some people that maybe are in a slum or in a, a third world country, just beggarly poor, and yet we see them, the external is they are so clean and, and nicely dressed and all that. Why? Because their heart is right. They are children of God. And God sees them through his eyes very differently than the world does. And so what matters to God is who we are on the inside. We'll never have the, the viewpoint that God has, but we can choose to want to see, obviously, through his eyes. God wants purity. Let's look at that in Proverbs 20, 11. I like this, and this applies not just to our teenagers, but all of our young folks. Even a child is known by his deeds, whether what he does is pure and right. Can I say that one more time? Even a child is known by his deeds, whether what he does is pure and right. I need to be thinking very early in my life, certainly as I become a child of God, that, that my, my actions matter and they're observed and, and my influence needs to be felt for the Lord. I find in this next verse here, Titus 1 verse 15, to the pure all things are pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving nothing is pure. But even their mind and their conscience are defiled. You see how God views things? Doesn't matter if they're ingesting harmful, dangerous food or water or they're breathing filthy air, but defilement. If you compare Matthew 15 and Mark 7, remember the observation some of the apostles bring to Jesus? In fact, it's the, the Pharisees, the Jews, are picking on the apostles because they are eating with unwashed hands. In the Jews' minds, they're dirty. And it's not even that they hadn't washed. It might have been that specifically they didn't wash according to a specified standard, this kind of little legalistic, man-made method of washing. They're not succumbing to that, therefore they're ritually defiled. Jesus says, wait just a minute. I'm glad you brought up the topic of defilement. Let's talk about where that really is. It talks about you Pharisees taking pains, I'm paraphrasing obviously here, to, to cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, and you're so concerned about this impurity. Jesus says, you know what? It's not what enters a man that defiles him, what comes out, out of the heart, remember? And he gives this litany of sins, and, and they included sexual sins and sins of speech, but all these things come out from a man. It's not this way in, it's this way out. And Jesus says, those defile a man. To eat with unwashed hands, no, nope. it's no big deal. You guys have missed the point. You are hopelessly off target here in trying to criticize these folks. And so this inward purity, 1 John 3, verse 3, everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he 
is pure. Jesus is the standard, the means by which I would ever choose to alter my life, to pattern it after one that uh, the world says is crazy. Are we given over to James 1.27, pure and undefiled religion before God the Father, visiting orphans and widows in their affliction and keeping ourselves unspotted from the world? God says, I, that matters to me. I'm concerned about that. Your friends may not think that's any big thing, and they may actually ridicule you if you're trying to live differently, unspotted from the world. God says, that's beautiful to me. That, uh, that purity is is on target there. Paul is committing himself, mentioning several things that would have contrasted him even from some other religious leaders. In 2 Corinthians 6, verse 6, one of those traits, one of those measures of uh, distinction was purity. Purity. Paul wasn't tuning his own horn. He wasn't trying to, to be self-inflated or egotistical, but it's a it's a measure, certainly, of understanding uh, that important fruit of the Spirit there. In Psalm 24, 3 and 4, let's talk about our heart. Four things that I want us to appreciate. When God says, I admire purity and I uh, want you to aspire to purity, may that begin with my heart, my heart. Psalm 24, actually, verse 3 and 4, the question is asked, who may ascend? into the hill of the Lord, or who may stand in his holy place? Answer is given in verse 4. In part, he who, number one, has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. You can go on and read what else Psalm 24 says, but at least that much. Clean hands and a pure heart. One reason I love children, and we all should love children, is their hearts and to know that they're at a, a phase or a stage that maybe in our minds we wish we could go back to, that innocence. Uh, sometimes, again, and, and kids could be stinkers. Uh, my grandkids will probably be stinkers some of the time, uh, but children are pure of heart. That's the message. Is it no wonder that Jesus, on those occasions, took a child up in the midst of him and took time out for the, the child and says, you know what, if... If you really want to be part of the kingdom of heaven, you'll become like a little child. Purity of heart. Let's see that in Matthew 5, 8, where Jesus, in the Beatitude, pronounced a blessing on the pure in heart. They shall see God. I want to see God. Therefore, I must and need to, to have a pure heart that God wants me to. All right? In 1 Timothy 1, 5, the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart and from a good conscience and from sincere faith. There's several other elements we're going to look at and emphasize in just a moment there, but, but Paul is saying here, you know, it matters. I think uh, one of the, the failures of the Old Testament Jews to fully grasp what God was doing through his law, even the Old Testament law, is they conceived of it somehow. It wasn't because the fault lay in the way God gave it, but they were trying to lift it out of its beauty and, and make it just a legalistic, performance-based system. But you find all the way back in Deuteronomy, God saying, love the Lord your God with all your heart. Sometimes they, they miss that. Maybe it was marked out in their version or something. They were not always heart people. We must be. And that's not to say heart as opposed to or in uh, certainly uh, just replacing something else, but, but it all begins with the heart. So many passages, more than we have time to list, would show the need for us to be uh, purer in heart as we even prayed in, in song uh, before the lesson there. And so, God, you want a, a pure heart? Sure. James 5, verse 8. That should be chapter 4, verse 8. If you're looking at the outline and you're saying, my Bible doesn't have that, that should be 4. Let me make that correction for us. And it says, draw near to God. He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. You see, it wasn't just in the Old Testament. You've got New Testament folks struggling with changes, alterations in life that were fundamentally rooted in a heart change. All of us know how important our, our physical heart is. The Bible would underscore the importance of the spiritual heart being right also. And then backing up there on the outline to 2 Timothy 2, verse 22, 
Paul tells the young preacher, flee also youthful lusts, but pursue righteousness and faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Some of you are wondering, well, we, we've got a title here for the lesson. I don't even know where that's from. In 1 Timothy 5, 22, Paul had talked about not laying hands on any man suddenly or becoming a partaker of other men's sins, but he says this, keep yourself pure. Think Timothy understood what he meant? I do. Well, well Paul, exactly what do you mean? Is, is it my heart, my conscience, uh, my mind, my body? It's everything, everything. And so if he's urging a, a fellow preacher to do that, wouldn't you think he'd be urging all of us to do it? Is your heart right with God? Have your affections been nailed to the cross? Is your heart right with God? How many times have we sung that? God wants uh, us to, to have hearts that are pleasing and, and righteous in his sight. We are told in the next place about the mind and uh, I've already used 1 Peter 1, there, but again, purifying your hearts, that's been underscored already, but is your mind pure as well? If you can easily, maybe for all of us, if you can define the difference between the Bible heart and mind, I wish you'd do that. I, sometimes it, it seems easy, you know, so we have this cognitive, this intellectual function, we have an emotional part of us, but you know what the the Bibles are kind of used interchangeably, and so it's not so easy to subdivide them or, or make them fit in their own nice, neat compartments. Heart and mind go together. And God says, along with your heart, your mind must be right. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 1. Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I wish to stir up your... He says your minds, but he uses a word there, our word of the hour, your pure minds by way of remember, uh, by way of reminder, rather. Philippians 4.8 says that, that if we are thinking on the right things, those will be things that are pure. God knows the importance of the mind. And here is, again, a function of the mind. It's my conscience. Paul has a lot to say about the conscience. In fact, his own, even in the book of Acts. But we come to, to 2 Timothy, uh, first, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 9. He's talking about the qualifications of leaders in God's church. And he says among these men that they're holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. My conscience is important. There are times I have violated my conscience, haven't you? There are times my conscience serves as a great tool to say, Brian, this looks questionable. I don't know that you can do this and feel real good about it. And so let's put the red light on. Let's put the brakes on. Stop. My conscience is important. Don't ever trade in your conscience. Don't ever uh, smooth off the rough edges of it to, to make it easier on you. We are too, in the words of 2 Timothy 1, 3, have a pure conscience. Paul says, I thank God whom I serve that way, as my forefathers did, that without ceasing I remember you in prayers night and day. A pure conscience. And so if my heart is right, and it's pure, and my mind is, and my conscience is, and all three of those are vitally connected. They are interrelated. You can't possibly try to extract them from one another. When I'm thinking right, and my heart is right, and I've got this, this alarm system reminding me of things that are questionable or outright wrong, my body is designed to follow suit. And choices I make, all choices uh, are ones that I can make in good conscience. Let no one despise your youth, Paul wrote, chapter 4 of Timothy, uh, 1 Timothy, that is, verse 12. Let no man look down upon you because you're young, but you be an example of the believers. There are six different ways. Your version may have only five of those, but, but one of those ways is impurity. Young people, your purity in every phase of your spiritual life is so important and so encouraging uh, to those who are older in faith. And then you find in, in 1 Timothy 5, verse 1 and 2, do not rebuke an older man, but exhort him of, as a father. And he talks about younger men as brothers, older women as sisters. Here's a little phrase maybe we've glossed over or, or read over so quickly. You treat, regard, you look upon the younger as sisters with all purity. 
in a church setting, in, in relationships in which there would be natural temptations, you make sure that you treat everybody in a way that is respectful of them and especially the young women. You regard them in a special way with all purity, all purity. I would encourage every young man in every congregation of the Lord's people to do that as well. And I know, again, if whether you have a sister or not, it's hard for you to imagine that, but you treat her in a way that you would want your sister, if you're thinking right, and if your heart is right, I wouldn't want anybody mistreating, hitting on my sister, doing something uh, uncouth with her. The, the lesson is you do the very same to those others around you. There's a passage to me, maybe one of the clearest in all the New Testament, about how we relate to one another in a very specific sphere of our body, part of the, the stewardship of our purity, and that is in the sexual arena. It's not one we study as much. In fact, I would say the 1 Corinthians 6 is the passage we often turn to. But I'll read for you, and you're welcome to read along in your translation, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 3 through 8. Listen to this, these enduring, these lasting words from Paul to Christians. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, if you will, your means of being made pure, that you should abstain, stay away from, keep away from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarned you and testified. Paul goes on and says, For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Let me stop right there. The uncleanness not referring to the body, not soap and shampoo and all that. Moral defilement. God didn't call us to that. God has called us to holiness. And so that's the only reason Paul could say, I'm reminding us about it. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God who has also given us his Holy Spirit. If you lay in front of you 1 Corinthians 6, 15 through 20, and our text here, 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 through 8, you'll see remarkable similarities, similar arguments. It matters what I do with every part of me, my heart, my mind, my conscience, my body. Why? Because I belong to God. A holy God who is perfectly pure, who has purified me, who demands from us certain things. We can't live like the world and be okay. And so these are things that haven't changed. This wasn't just limited to the first century. This was not confined to the city of Thessalonica. These are things that in all places and every time we must adhere to and abide by if we truly love God and respect his word there. And so fast forward to where we are today. Does it trouble you that we've got our school systems debating at what age we ought to introduce sexual education. Some of them are saying, you know, when they're kindergartners and first and second and third graders, we need to be telling them about their body and about how that you really don't know yet if you're heterosexual or homosexual. And, and so you need to be open and experiment and all those things. I listen to some of that and I look at this and I'm thinking, you know what? Our elementary school children don't need to be thinking about that. Our middle school kids, although there are some urges and some feelings that are being stirred and they're changing, don't need to be thinking about how to express themselves. I'm not listening to God, not until I'm married. And in fact, if I live to be in my 20s and 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, and I don't get married, I will never have the right or opportunity to explore those feelings or act them out. If I'm intent on being a Christian, being pure. Our world today thinks that is so hopelessly silly, stupid, old-fashioned. Why in the world would you even choose to go along with that? And all I can say is, God said it. It's enough for me. Nothing about living in 2015 makes us that different from any other generation. I know we have it shoved down our throats. We are seeing unprecedented pressure to go along with anything regarding the body, including our sexual function. All I'm saying is, 
Keep listening to God. Let his voice win. He's right. If everybody in the world were doing what was ungodly and immoral sexually in another way, it wouldn't make it right at all. God is saying, listen to this. Respect how this is under the umbrella. This is one aspect of your life. It's an important one. But if you understand the importance of purity in everything else, please exercise the restraint, the self-control, the true love for me that will show your honor for me. And may I underscore this once more. This applies to everybody in here, youngest to the oldest, the male and the female, the black and the white. It matters what we do with ourselves. And may we live in a way that corresponds to what we understand as the truth. An invitation will be given at this point. This has been a long lesson. You've, uh, by and large, listened very patiently. You've endured it. And many of you I know appreciate. I, I love the word. I want to hear what it says. Do you need to make changes in your life? Do you need to become a Christian? 1 Corinthians 6 talks about it's assumed from a standpoint of those already Christians. But you see, it's not enough just to live a good moral life apart from Christ. Live that life once you are in Christ, once you've heard, confessed the name of Jesus, repented of your sins, been immersed to have those alien sins washed away, then walking in the light. Live a steadfast, faithful life. God will bless you in this life. He'll bless you obviously, more importantly, in the one beyond. So if you need to make changes or maybe ask for prayers, let any desire of your heart be made known now as we continue to, to stand and sing.